Everything about Luke's character fits so well with the title of this anime, The World's Finest Assassin. And that may not seem like a praiseworthy thing, but with the number of fantasy shows with like hero-like formulas and yeah, we're following an assassin and typically that's not a heroic thing, but it all kind of boils into the same type of territory. They usually don't live up to the title of their anime. Like when you hear of the world's finest assassin, you're probably expecting like, oh, he's good at sniping or something like that. But what really makes him the world's finest assassin? And following Luke over these five episodes, seeing him from his mature assassination style self to now in this younger form, but actually getting even better because now he's gaining new skills he never could have learned in his original world, mixed with magic and these new tools that basically make him the ultimate killer. Everything from his practical mindset, the way he manipulates, the way that he keeps people on his side, the way that he turns what could have been an easy trope of a bitchy knight who thought he was better than him, immediately gets bested and because Luke recognizes that as he gets older, you know, he wants to surround himself by powerful allies, and despite his arrogance, he's a very good knight, so let's put him on our side. Everything about him doesn't feel like an isekai protagonist, but rather the world's finest assassin. And I have to say, if there was any way for this show to get better, I really thought after last week I was at my peak enjoyment, but no, it feels like we're really just getting started. The idea of the final test, it very much screams to me, you have to kill the head leader and become the head leader yourself. I really feel like we're going to eventually build up to that. But as it stands, we did get that father and son kind of confrontation. And it actually lived up to, I think, as well as it should. Because there's two main factors at play with the father and the son fighting in a kind of life or death situation. Obviously, neither one would probably really want to fully kill. But at the same time, if you hold back, you're going to get yourself killed. So it is still a dangerous situation even if feelings are involved. For Luke, he's actually starting to care about the people in his own new organization. If it was his original life, he would have killed his father without much struggle. But because he actually generally cares for him, he did hold back in certain ways. But in terms of the magic, you definitely see the mindset of, you know, that wouldn't really be fair given that it was a proper assassination test. But the idea of the father, right? I mean, he's someone who is, without doubt, the most skilled member the family has ever seen. He is the top dog. For a young kid to beat the top dog, it would be unheard of and would make him the most promising member the family has ever seen. Which, of course, we know is going to be the case given how he did the most perfect build an assassination style character should ever want to build. But to see how he very much was cautious and how he definitely was trying to protect his life but at the same time he didn't want to full on kill his father. So you have this interesting dynamic of Luke actually valuing life while at the same time, you have this father who's this master assassin, and you want to see the anime deliver, like he's doing things that make him live up to his own title. From the crossbows, to his silent sneak attacks, to the number of traps laid, the fact that he ultimately only lost because of some pretty careful deductions, it felt like they blunted the two things they need to the most. A father with skill, and they made us feel like he had the skill. I mean, hell, we had to go into slow-mo so many times to just to avoid basically death's doorstep. To then also Luke having contemplations and feeling uneasy at certain points, which is a new feeling for even for him. I mean, to see the number of times he just manipulates so smoothly. It's not like he doesn't care about characters like Tart, right? Obviously, he values her and he likes her seemingly as a person, but he knows how to keep her heart wrapped around all of his fingers. From that scene in the carriage to basically her like asking him, like, are you just doing this to keep me on your side? Absolutely. Like, he knows when to not bullshit and he knows how to, like, in the first time they met there with the way of the food, the home, everything like that, He's definitely sealed the deal with her, and to see even the night situation, which I definitely want to touch back on again, it's something that you've probably seen plenty of times. There's some form of rich nobility who thinks they deserve something another rich nobility is currently having, and that usually translates to the main character or someone close to the main character. And either one of two things happens. The main character wins and basically makes a lifelong enemy, 
or the main character loses and basically gets, you know, that emotional hug from the person he's probably trying to protect and wants to bang someday. And what we had here was we had a very smooth assassination slash dislocating the shoulder. But then afterwards, he makes him one of those valuable blades, but this time a sword, and compliments and calls out like, you know, you never would have beat me. Hell, if you're feeling bad that someone four years younger than you got, you know, kicked your ass, how do you think my father feels? He's like 35 years older than me, right? So I love how he recognizes who should be an ally and in the future, what type of people does he want on his side? It's not like he needs to look over his shoulder and be scared of the guy. He could kill him if need be. But why would you kill someone with insane talent that could be a very valuable knight and adversary for you someday? And the fact that it immediately changed what should be a trope into a unique addition to the world's finest assassin? That type of stuff you don't get to see enough and deserves to be praised time and time again. Now I do have to say, I really hope this becomes an ongoing gag. This is now the second time we've seen the show kick off and we see the goddess in a different time period bringing in a hero we had the previous time with this person who should have been a nice, very strong military mind, became the ultimate neat. Then we get this samurai who I was like, what are they going to do to make it different? And then you see him just pretty much getting himself killed and obliterated because he's trying to kill the hero because, you know, a god came down and talked to him. I'm very curious, past just the humor of the different time periods, either A, she's doing this for multiple worlds, or B, she's just bullshitting around because she's bored. And if she is going the route of like doing it to multiple worlds, I'm very, very curious about her true motives about if, you know, that really is all about saving the world because it feels like we're in a mixture of boredom slash malice. And I'm very curious what the true end goal will be when it comes to Luke and her. Like that's something that's still actively on my mind. But I appreciate that they're keeping her relevant, even if it is just seeing the number of times in Heroes she tries to send back to kill a hero, and oh my god, the assassination ranges of comedy is pretty damn spectacular. I do want to say though, the moment after the test and we see all the numerous assassinations from the silent kill in the neck to the poison drip in the person's mouth who is sleeping, lighting the candle, bursting of flames, shot in the back by an arrow, to even just the way they cover up their kills, like the fact that one of the nobles that they killed strip him and take him of his valuables, given his own histories with bandits, it all just lines up and should send a message to anyone who wants to make the same type of deal. It's really cool how much logic is being applied past just how smart of a kill. The aftermath and the preparation is equally important, that's why we're sending Lugin as a merchant, giving new identity, we see the father himself has all these different identities. Everything about it feels like it's living up to the world's finest assassin, and I'm so happy about that. This has been probably one of the biggest surprises for me this season, and I'm so happy to be loving it as much as I am, but let me know your thoughts and feelings. New characters got introduced to, new ranges for Luke's character. Let me know what you're feeling down below. Leave a like if you enjoyed, and subscribe if you're new around here. So until next time, everyone, please take care and have a good one.